if, if you're reading through your Bible from cover to cover, by the time you get to this book, you've read through a whole lot of Israelite history. You've met the patriarchs. You've lived through the Exodus, the conquests. You've lived through all the kings. You've gone to exile, and you've even come back. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, this man, Job, just pops onto the pages of history. He's an unknown man. He's from an uncertain place. He's of unknown origin and from an unknown time. He is not an Israelite. He doesn't seem to know any Israelites. And yet, this man is righteous in the sight of the God of Israel. God himself testifies about this man, that there is none like him in the earth. Well, from the outset of this book, it challenges our small view of God. It teaches us that God is bigger than our rigid, neatly constructed, tidy little theological systems. It reveals that God is bigger even than his plans for Israel. So this book is all about our big, mysterious, powerful, and wise, beyond comprehension God. It's about Job's God, our God, the God who rules over evil, the God who creates scary creatures like the Leviathan for reasons we can't fully grasp. He's a God who uses Satan to accomplish his wise and hidden purposes. And it's this God that is at the center of our story. He is an unparalleled God, and there is none like him in all the universe. And we get to see him. We get to see him through the eyes of Job who is an unparalleled man, because there is none like him in all the earth. But this man, this unparalleled man, is suffering. And didn't you just grieve with him last week as we worked our way through chapter 3? Well, how should we suffer? And how should we help others who are suffering? Those questions are really at the heart of these 11 chapters. And they are big questions for a big book. And we're going to start just trying to answer those questions in three steps tonight. First, we're going to look at the interpretive interpretive key for this part of our Bibles. Second, we're going to summarize the dialogues between Job and his friends. Third, we're going to analyze and then reflect on what we've learned. And we're going to begin just kind of probing for answers to these questions. How do we suffer? How do we help others who are suffering? Okay, first, I'm going to talk fast we got a lot to cover. First, let's remember the interpretive key. We find that in Job 42, 7 through 8. So we know that God has already rendered his verdict on all the speeches we're covering tonight. And here is what he says. My anger burns against you, Eliphaz, and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So when Job's friends speak, they kindle God's anger. That's what you need to remember. And even though Job isn't perfect in all his words, God is very pleased with him and how he speaks about God. So remember this divine verdict as you work your way through the dense poetry. All right, let's summarize the dialogues, and this is going to be the longest section of the lesson, but it's useful to kind of clarify what's going on. Keep your Bibles open so you can follow along. So at the end of chapter 3, Job closes his first lament in verse 26 with, I have not rest, and trouble comes. And those are prophetic words because more trouble is coming. To the pain of his financial devastation, the grief of bereavement, to the loss of his standing and community, to the despair of his physical pain, Job's friends, the ones who know him best and should provide the deepest comfort, now add slander and accusation to his suffering, insult to injury. Let's begin with Eliphaz in chapters 4 and 5. So Eliphaz is probably the oldest, wisest, and certainly, at least initially, he's the nicest. And he is disturbed by Job's lament. I mean, as we all would, would be, if you heard your friends loudly despairing of life, you too would be disturbed. So he ventures, that's the word he uses, a word with Job, beginning with recognizing many of Job's good deeds. But he quickly follows his commendation with a subtle claim about Job's character. That's in 4, 7, and 8, and here it is. Remember who that was 
innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? Now, we know that word upright. We've seen it before. And right away, that should cause you to doubt what Eliphaz is saying, because God himself used this word to talk about Job's character. Eliphaz continues, As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Okay, you hear what he's saying? You reap what you sow. You get what you deserve. And Job, you've reaped trouble. That must mean you've sown trouble. And he bases that conclusion on two lines of evidence. First, on his own observation. So he says, as I have seen, this is what he's observed in the natural world. And then he employs some like natural theology to prove his point. He's like, so lions are dangerous and deadly beasts, right? And what reward do they get for their evil deeds? Well, they often go hungry, their teeth are shattered, and their cubs are scattered. Don't you see, Job? Suffering is the reward for evil. Well, his second line of evidence comes from some sort of supernatural revelation. We see this in 4.12, where he says, a word was brought to me stealthily. And then if you drop down to verse 17, he tells you what that word is. Can a mortal man be right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? And these are rhetorical questions. So you're supposed to say, well, no. But again, the reader knows better. God has already established that Job, a mortal man, is right before him. So the perceptive reader recognizes that God cannot be the source of Eliphaz's revelation. Eliphaz goes on, though, he says, Job, God doesn't even count his angels as innocent, so clearly you cannot be innocent either. So here, I think Eliphaz rightly senses that Job is going to maintain his righteousness and blame God for treating him unfairly. And he does not think that Job should accuse God of injustice. So this is his gentle word of caution. But his counsel to a worked up Job is this. Don't get all hot and bothered, Job. Calm down and stop complaining. That's my loose paraphrase, paraphrase of 5-2. Look at it with me. He says, surely vexation kills the fool, and jealousy, that's this angry railing that Job is doing against injustice, and jealousy slays the simple. So at this point, if we haven't already questioned Eliphaz's wisdom, we should be now. I mean, how well does it work for you when you say to an angry person, calm down? It's condescending, right? But Eliphaz plows on, and here he employs a little proverbial wisdom. So if you look at 517, he says, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. We get the same proverb in the book of Proverbs 313, and later the author of Hebrews is going to take up the same truth to encourage his suffering audience. But the problem for Eliphaz is that for him, the discipline of the Lord is always punitive. It is always the reward for bad behavior. Well, if Eliphaz were right and Job is being punished for sin, then his counsel is sound. Look at it. It's in 5 verses 8 and 9. He tells Job to seek God and commit your cause to him. But Eliphaz is telling Job to seek God in repentance. And Eliphaz presumes that when Job repents, that God will restore him to his former greatness. If you read chapter 5, 17 through 27, it's like reading the blessings promised to Israel. If Job just repents, well, he's going to get his health and his wealth back. He'll be protected from evil and famine and war and slander, even wild beasts. He'll be guaranteed peace, prosperity, bountiful offspring, and a long life. Everything Job had before will be his again if he just repents. So this speech reveals that the gospel, according to Eliphaz, is do good and your life will be good. So as you can see, the prosperity gospel is not exclusively an American invention. It has thrived since ancient times. Well, Job has a few words for Eliphaz, and his response is so relatable. What do you think he responds to first? Well, the first thing Job responds to is Eliphaz's infuriating exhortation to calm down, stop complaining. 
Essentially, he says, you're telling me to calm down? Can't you see how much I'm suffering? How strange it would be, Eliphaz, for a hungry donkey to quit braying, or for a starving cow not to bellow. It is natural. It is even good that I lament. That's in chapter 6, 1 through 6. And so wounded is Job by his friends that he quickly returns to his original request for God to take his life and hasten the day. He wants it to come quickly because if I could die now, Job thinks, I could at least take comfort in the fact that I did not curse God. That's essentially what he is saying in 6.10. Look at it with me. This would be my comfort. I would even exult in pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. This reminds me of that old hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, where the writer in the last verse says, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for you. Job is righteous, and he wants to die righteous. This is the cry of every persevering saint. Let me be faithful to death. Well, his second impulse is to kind of rail on his friends. So we see this in verses six, in chapter 6, 14 through 20. He calls them treacherous, and then he paints a picture of what they are like. He says, suppose a caravan of weary travelers is making its way through the desert. Their supplies are running low, and they're thirsty, and they still have a quite a distance to go before they're out of the dangers of the wilderness. But they remember that there's a stream a little bit off course that waters the land, and they think, well, we're thirsty. Should we go off course and get water, or do we stay the course and get out of the desert? Well, in their thirst, they turn off course and they head toward the stream, hoping to find refreshment to finish their journey. Only instead of refreshment, they find a scorched, dried up riverbed. That's what Job's friends were like. It was like the promise of comfort in suffering. But in the end, they only brought him more pain. Now, Job's next movement is, for the sake of argument, to entertain Eliphaz's claim and issue a challenge. Look at 624. He says, teach me, and then I will be silent. Make me understand where I have gone astray. Okay, let's say I am suffering because of my sin. Show me. In other words, I'll stop complaining, Eliphaz, if you can tell me what I've done to deserve this. And he knows Eliphaz is going to come up empty. So he steadfastly maintains his integrity. Sadly, though, his friends will take up this challenge and will begin to invent things that he has done to deserve God's punishment. Well, next, fourth, after Job rails against his friends and he issues this challenge, he actually turns away from them and he begins to speak directly to God. No longer is he just kind of throwing out his why questions into the void as he did in the first chapter, first lament of chapter three. Now he is asking God directly to relent and to help him understand why he is suffering. He asks God at least six questions in this renewed lament. And maybe you or you have asked these questions yourselves. Why is life so hard? Why do you scrutinize me? Can you just look away from me? Why are you treating me like your enemy? What have I ever done to you? Why do you hedge me in as if I'm dangerous, treating me like the chaotic sea or a vicious sea monster? And then finally, how long, O oh Lord? Well, after this lament, Job momentarily runs out of words and Bildad seizes his opportunity. He, this is chapter 8 now, he has listened long enough. In his assessment, Eliphaz was far too gentle. So he zealously rebukes Job, thinking that he needs to defend God's character from Job's attacks. So Bildad meets Job's lamentable, how long, O Lord, with a how long of his own. Look at it, it's an 8-2. He says, how long will you say these things? Then he reduces all of Job's complaints to a single accusation in verse 3. Does God pervert justice? So Bildad here, he rightly understands what Job is arguing. Job says, I'm not suffering because I've sinned. I've done nothing to deserve this. But if Bildad accepts Job's innocence, 
it's going to rattle his rigid, neatly constructed theological grid. Bildad's wisdom doesn't allow for unjust suffering because it could mean that God doesn't always rule the world according to that strict principle of justice. And if that is true, he can think of no other conclusion to draw except that God himself is unjust. And Bildad won't stand for that. Instead of wrestling with this truth that challenges his theology, he stubbornly clings to his rigid theology. No, suffering is always the reward for sin. Look at 8.4. This is Bildad's claim, and this is where things get really ugly. If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hands of their transgression. Do you hear his claim? It's the same as Eliphaz's. Your children got what they deserved. They reaped what they sowed. And if you remember from chapter 1 just how concerned Job was for the spiritual condition of his children, this was especially grievous to him. Remember, he would offer sacrifices to atone for his children after their feast days. And all his children died during one of those feast days before Job could intercede for them with sacrifice. Bildad's words are cruel. He is meaner than Eliphaz, but his claim and his counsel are the same. Let's read his counsel together in 8, 5, and 6. He tells Job, if you will seek God, which, of course, is what Job is doing, if you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, there's that word again, Job is upright, if you are upright, Surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. So Bildad's gospel is the same as Eliphaz's. If you do good, you'll get good. Well, chapters 9 and 10, Job, Job now has some words for Bildad. And here I think he exercises remarkable restraint. Maybe he's worn out a little bit from his last speech but I can't believe he didn't punch Bildad when he made the comment about his children. But instead of railing against Bildad, he accepts, for the time, he accepts Bildad's premise. 9-2, chapter 9, verse 2, he says, Truly, I know that it is so. Okay, Bildad, you're right. God punishes the wicked, and he rewards the righteous. But then he goes on in verse 2, but how can a man be right before God? This is what Job really wants. He wants to be right before God. He wants to be, a to be able to stand in his presence. He wants a hearing with God. And how is he going to get it? Well, what comes out next is all his bitterness and anguish over God's inaccessibility. He can't seem to get God's attention. How can he ever truly be right with him? And yet... In 920, we again see that Job knows he's blameless. Look at it. Though I am blameless, he, that's God, would prove me perverse. This is Job's acknowledging what his friends assume. He's like, I get it. It looks bad. If suffering is a reward for sin and God just keeps sending me more suffering, it's like God himself is testifying against Job and against his blamelessness. The more Job suffers, the more he seems to prove his wickedness. But Job maintains his blamelessness. blamelessness. So look what he feels forced to conclude in 9, 22, and 23. He, again, that's God, destroys both the blameless and the wicked. And when disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. And here Job accuses God of cruelty. Maybe he does pervert justice, Bildad. Notice here, Job, nor any of his three friends, doesn't doubt that God is sovereign, only that he is just. Look at verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? And his friends have no answer to this question. They can't even entertain the idea. 
but Job has stumbled onto a deep truth here. It is the sovereign God who sometimes gives the earth into the hands of the wicked. It is the sovereign God who sometimes masks the judges so that justice is perverted. It is the sovereign God who put everything Job had, including his health, into the hands of Satan. It is the sovereign God who ordains suffering for the innocent. And that's a mercy for all of us that he does so. But it doesn't feel like mercy to Job. If the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper, Job concludes in 9, 29 through 31, that he shouldn't even bother with repentance or righteousness. If God isn't just, why bother with righteousness? So he entertains his friend's claim that suffering is always the reward for sin just to dismantle it. And then he returns to asking God for an audience. There's a profound moment here in 933 where Job longs for an arbiter between God and himself, someone to bring them together, to put his hand on God and a hand on Job and bring them together so that Job can talk to God without fear. Job knows he is unequal to God, but maybe, somehow, someday, someone can reconcile the two. Well, after this reflection, Job turns once more to address God directly. His friends can't help him, so he looks past them. They're in his way, and he gets them out of the way so he can talk to God. In chapter 10, he returns to his lament, asking another series of why questions and pleading for God to leave him alone. Maybe some of these questions are familiar to you as well. Why do you despise me, God? Why do you hunt me? Why did you give me life? Why won't you just kill me. This third lament is also a direct address to God. No longer is he asking like he did in chapter 3, why was I allowed to live? He asks, why did you make me? He is getting bolder in his address to God. And this is another sign that Job is not giving up. He is never going to curse God. He might flirt with the idea that God is unjust, but he hasn't rejected him. In fact, he is more invested in this relationship with God than ever. And though the truth or the, the wisdom that he is seeking is just clouded with the suffering he's enduring, even still, Job is going to stumble around in the darkness, just reaching out for God. And he doesn't know it yet, but he is getting closer, closer to wisdom, and closer to its source. Chapter 11. While Job stumbles around in the darkness of suffering, his friends are stuck. They aren't moving at all. They make no progress. And if you thought Bildad was bad, get ready for Zophar. Zophar has zero sympathy. With every word, he seems to just harden his heart toward Job. Now, I bet many of you have heard your friends say some pretty shocking or irreverent things about God when they have suffered. And maybe you have a similar zeal inside of you. You want to defend God's character, or you want to call people out for complaining about the suffering God has ordained for them. Well, this is Zophar's instinct, and he goes so far. Sorry. Let's see if any of you are awake and catch the pun. <laughs> But Zophar accuses Job, again, of spilling too many words. Too many words, Job. This is a common theme among his friends. He tells him, God alone is the source of wisdom, Job, not you. You should shut your mouth. And then he attacks Job's character in 11 verse 6, saying, God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Zophar is almost as eager as Job is, for Job to get his audience with God. Because Zophar wants God to rebuke Job for his arrogance. Well, mercifully, Zophar's first speech is the shortest of the three friends. At least he's not a hypocrite. He's not going to spill too many words. 
He doesn't talk too much, but his claim and his counsel are the same. Look at 11, 14, and 15. It says, if iniquity is in your hand, and it is, Job, put it far away and let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and you will not fear. There it is again, the gospel according to Zophar. Repent, be blessed. Well, chapters 12 to 14, we find Job's response to Zophar. In these final two chapters of our lesson, Job responds to Zophar. So far, there has been very little variety to the friends' speeches. They have one message. They are constrained by their rigid, neatly constructed, tidy little theological system. They have no imagination. They can think of only one reason why Job is suffering. He must have sinned. Job, on the other hand, is just full of ideas and variety in his speech. You can actually see as you plow through these, you can see his depth of wisdom compared to his friends. He is willing to have his theological grid challenged. He is searching for wisdom so that he can correct and repair his theology. But Job initially meets Zophar's accusations with sarcasm. Look at verse 1, chapter 12. No doubt you are the people, and the people here is kind of code for what we would call the influencers of our day. No doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. Then he mocks Zophar's trite wisdom in verse 3, saying, Of course I know God is the only source of wisdom. Ugh, everybody knows that. The unparalleled Job here is the only one among his wise friends who can see that their rigid theology doesn't account for reality. It's far too simplistic. It's far too black and white. And if his friends would just open their eyes for a moment and look around, they would see what even the birds and the bushes know, that good does not always come to those who do good. And Job lists off several proofs of this reality. In 12.6, we see that robbers live in peace and idolaters live in security. In 12.15, we see that sometimes God withholds water and famine results, or sometimes he just sends too much and there's a flood. And then in 12.22, Job says that in God's inscrutable wisdom, he makes nations great only then to destroy them later. Job knows that his friend's wisdom is utterly inadequate and therefore bereft of any comfort for the innocent sufferer. His friends are predictable and useless, so he rejects them and their wisdom. In 13.1, he says, What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. I would speak to the Almighty. He's done with his friends. He wants to speak to God. And then prophetically, in chapter 13, he imagines his friends with him in the courtroom with God. It's God versus Job, and his friends presume to speak for God. Job knows God will reject their small theology. They do not represent him. Instead, in chapter 13, 10, and 11, Job imagines that God would, will angrily rebuke and terrify them and their wisdom will just go up in smoke. Here's how Job sums up the wisdom of his friends, 13, 12. Your maxims are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. And he is not wrong. We already know the rest of the story. So now Job is done with his friends. In 13, 5, he tells them to be silent and that their silence will be wiser than their words. And that probably felt really good to say. They have been trying to shut him up all this time. And now Job says in 13, 13, let me have silence and I will speak. And speak he does, but not to his friends. He once again takes up his case with God. He knows he's being bold, perhaps too bold. But even if God kills him, he is not going to stop running after God. That's what we find in 1315. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. 
Where else can Job go? Who else can provide any meaning to his miserable life? He continues his search for God and he wanders all over the place. But like a child playing hide and seek in the dark, he does get closer and closer to the one who seems to be hiding. Here's just a sampling of where Job wanders in his speech. In 1326, he begins to wonder if he's suffering the inheritance for the iniquities of his youth. He recognizes he isn't so upright that he's never sinned. He has sinned, but he supposed those sins had been dealt with through sacrifices, like the ones he used to make for his children. In 14.1, he laments the nature of human existence. He sounds much like Moses in Psalm 90. He says, man is few of days and full of trouble. In 14.13, he begs God to remember him. He says that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. In the next verse, 14.14, 14, Job actually ponders resurrection. He's getting somewhere now, isn't he? If a man dies, shall he live again? And his hope begins to build. If God will remember him, and if man does live again, then look at the rest of 14, 14, and 15. Then all the days of my life, of my service, I would wait till my renewal should come. You would call, and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. It is a beautiful picture of the steadfast love of God and of resurrection of a God that does not forget or forsake the work of his hands, but a God that even after they die, calls for them to raise them to a new and better life. If this were true, Job thinks he could endure anything. He would wait all the days of his life for that call. That's Job's hope, but like water cupped in, your, in a hand, it kind of slips through his fingers after a little bit, but just for a little bit. In the closing verses of chapter 14, he seems to despair of this hope. He worries that he'll simply fade away, pass from the pages of history without ever seeing God. But even in Job's flickering hope here, we see his steadfastness. He longs for God. He pursues him. He wants God more than anything else. And he doesn't just want God to be vindicated, though he does want that. He wants more than simple vindication. He wants God to remember and return to him, to love him, to call his name. He wants to be with the God who made him and the God who loves him. All right. We made it through. Let's now reflect just a little bit on what we've just discussed and apply what we've learned. So first, what we need to see is what God sees, is that Job is remarkable. And we're getting to see it here. He is evolving and he is growing in wisdom as he suffers. And one lesson we can learn from Job is to lament and to let lament. Live and let live, lament and let lament. The longer Job's suffering persists, kind of the longer his speeches grow. But he says less and less to his friends and more and more to God. His first lament of chapter three just kind of spills out into the darkness, but su successive laments are spoken directly to God. The lament is the process by which Job wrestles with God he does battle with his own shallow theology, and he grows. He makes progress toward God every time he laments. Somehow, his complaints to God and even his complaints about God push him closer and closer to true wisdom and to the source of that wisdom. Job gets more profound the longer he speaks. Did you see that? He spoke of an arbiter to Bildad. Now he's thinking about the possibility of resurrection. Look how far he's come. So lament, wrestle with God in your suffering, and let your friends lament. 
Don't quickly disrupt the God-given process of wrestling with him and finding God in the suffering. Second, where is Satan in all of this? Satan is not mentioned again. He is too ignoble a player in the drama to get another mention. And I think in ignoring him, we can see that God's wise purposes for suffering go far beyond just proving Satan wrong. That would be too petty. God is doing so much more. He is revealing himself to his servant that he loves so much. Job is going to see God through his suffering. And Satan is now just an afterthought. Even so, Satan would still love to see Job curse God, and I don't think he's given up. Tempt a man when he's weak, right? Isn't that what a lion does when he hunts? He kind of picks off the young or the wounded, the stragglers in a herd of buffalo. Well, Job is weakened and vulnerable when his friends show up, kind of like Jesus after his baptism. Jesus is in the wilderness, surrounded by wild animals. He's hungry because he's been fasting for weeks. And that is when Satan appears to tempt him. Similarly, Job's friends begin their slanderous speeches when Job is at his weakest. And they try to silence Job over and over again. Stop complaining. You're full of hot air. You're a bag of wind, one of them says. Satan must know the power of lament in drawing us closer to God, and he is anxious to shut it down. But Job steadfastly carries on, and God, in his unfathomable wisdom, uses what Satan intended for evil for good. Job's friends, rather than silencing him, no matter how much they try, they goad him on. He keeps talking. He keeps lamenting. And in that process, he searches for God. And guess what? He finds him. Third, the friend's theology isn't just misguided. It's wicked. This is why God's anger is kindled against them. They try to take this big God and just cram him into their little theological box. They slander Job, and they deny God's wisdom in ordaining the suffering of the innocent. While Job progresses in his theological understanding, his friends are stuck. They are small people with a small God. They refuse to wrestle with God, and they just kind of shut up their ears to Job's suffering. Otherwise, they too might be forced to contend with a God who ordains suffering for the innocent. They pay lip service, they write beautiful poetry about the wisdom of God, but then they deny the very wisdom that will be their salvation. What if God did not ordain suffering for the innocent? Well, then we are all damned. All our hopes in this life and in the next all of Job's hopes, even if he doesn't quite understand this yet, all of our hopes hinge on the wisdom of God in crushing his own innocent son. In these dialogues, we learn that theology is for the suffering. So when we suffer, when our friends suffer, lament and seek God. Challenge your theology. Grow in your understanding of God and push your suffering friends to do the same. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's the story of Job. Seek when you suffer. Push your friends to do the same. You can talk or you can point. And pointing is far better. Let them find God for themselves and be patient with them in the messy process. Fourth, God will remember you. He will long for the work of his hands, and he will call you, and you will answer. Hebrews 5, 7 says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. 
Jesus lamented, Jesus suffered, and Jesus died. But after three days, on the morning after the Sabbath, God called for Jesus, and Jesus answered. He shook off all of his suffering along with the shroud of death, and he rose to glory. And that day, dear friends, will come for you too, but only because God, in his wisdom, ordained suffering for the innocent Jesus. Only because God, in his matchless wisdom, ordained his death and his resurrection. So that when we seek God, we will find him, and we will be forever with the one who made us and the one who loves us. Let's pray. Oh, great God, you are wisdom beyond our understanding, and you have glorious purposes for our suffering. Help us like Job, help us like Jesus, to steadfastly cry out to you, the one who hears, the one who loves, and the one who calls for us. In Jesus' name, amen.